Well, good morning, church. Welcome to another daily Bible reading. Um, today is a little bit of an unusual day. This is Monday, and normally there is not a daily Bible reading for this day. But this is to correct an error on this past Saturday. I actually did a special reading for Saturday, but I did not upload it. Instead, I uploaded Fridays twice. And so the so we've got basically two of the same Bible readings on Friday and Saturday. So my apologies for those of you who have been following along and ended up hearing the same reading twice in a row. Um, so I had to go back. Unfortunately, I had um, already deleted those recordings. So going back and doing it again and going to upload this for Monday morning. So let me go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time this morning. I pray that you be with us and help us to be filled by your spirit to understand your word, um, that we may be able to apply it to our lives and continue to grow in greater Christ likeness. And we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at our passage for this morning. We are taking a look at four chapters here. Second Chronicles chapters 29 to 31 and 1 Corinthians 8. And we may remember that in prior chapters, we had been reading about King Ahaz. And King Ahaz was this evil king in Judah, um, perhaps the most evil king in Judah up to this point. He had actually closed the temple doors. He had set up a lot of places of worship to false gods throughout Jerusalem and Judea. He had been warned numerous times, had opportunities to repent and did not do so. And so Judah was really paying the price because of it. But as we turn our attention to chapter 29, we find that his son Hezekiah was an exception. And Hezekiah ended up at this point, um, we will see, he ends up being one of the best kings of Judah up until this point. Verse 1, we see that Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. Now we had seen some prior kings of Judah who were also good, but every time or almost every time at least, um, that the scriptures tell us that he was a good king like David, there was an exception, um, except that he left the high places and people continued to worship in the high places. But in this case, we don't have any kind of disclaimer clause. We're simply told that he did like his father had done. And then in verse 3, we see that he addresses the temple. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them into the square on the east. Then he said to them, Listen to me, O Levites, consecrate yourselves now, and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry the uncleanness out from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord, and have turned their backs. They have also shut the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord was against Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of terror or horror and of hissing. And you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. And uh, he is referring to the captivity that some of Judah had already been taken into as a result of those sins of his father Ahaz. They were taken to Aram. They were taken to Edom. You see that in Second Chronicles 28, verses 5 through 8, and then again, verse 17. And as we continue on, Hezekiah says this, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his burning anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him, to minister to him, to be his ministers and burn incense. And so the Levites are assembled, they're consecrated. It says, then the Levites arose, Mahat, the son of Amasai, and Joel, the son of Azariah, and the sons of the Kohathites, and from the sons of Merari, Kish, and the sons of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jeh Jehalelel, and from the Gersh Gershonites, Joah, the son of Zima and Eden, the son of Joah, and so on and so forth. And so we get these names of people that were pulled together as part of the Levites who were consecrated to be priests. Verse 15 says, They assembled their brothers, consecrated them, and went in to cleanse the house of the Lord according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord. And so starting in verse 16, we see the temple is cleansed. So the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. And every unclean thing which they found in the temple of the Lord, they brought out to the court of the house of the Lord. 
Then the Levites received it to carry it out to the Kidron Valley. Now they began the consecration on the first day of the first month, and on the eighth day of the month they entered the porch of the Lord. Then they consecrated the house of the Lord in eight days, and finished on the sixteenth day of the first month. Then they went into King Hezekiah and said, We have cleansed the whole house of the Lord, the altar of the burnt offering with all its utensils, and the table of the showbread with all of its utensils. Moreover, all the utensils which King Ahaz had discarded during his reign and his unfaithfulness, we have prepared and consecrated, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. So the temple is cleansed, it's prepared, and Hezekiah then goes ahead and leads Judah in sacrifice, starting in verse 20. Then King Hezekiah arose early and assembled the princes of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. They brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats for a sin offering to the kingdom, the sanctuary, and Judah. And he ordered the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they slaughtered the bulls, and the priests took the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. They also slaughtered the rams and sprinkled the blood on the altar. They slaughtered the lambs also and sprinkled the blood on the altar. Then they brought the male goats of the sin offering before the king and of the assembly, and they laid their hands on them. The priests slaughtered them and purged the altar with their blood to atone for Israel, for the king ordered the burnt offering and the sin offering for all Israel. And then we see the singers are arranged, the singers and the instrumentalists. He then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with harps, with lyres. According to the command of David and of Gad, the king seer, and Nathan, the prophet, for the command was from the Lord through his prophets. The Levites stood with the musical instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. And then we see the burnt offerings begin. The, then Hezekiah gave the order to offer the burnt offerings on the altar. When the burnt offerings began, the song of the Lord also began with the trumpets, accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. While the whole assembly worshipped, the singers also sang, the trumpets sounded. All this continued until the burnt offerings was finished. Now at the completion of the burnt offerings, the king and all who were present with him bowed down and worship. Moreover, King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. And this is to sing from the Psalms, I believe. So they sang praises with joy, bowed down and worshiped. And then verse 32, the assembly is invited to bring their sacrifices and offerings. Then Hezekiah said, now that you have consecrated yourself to the Lord, come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings, and all those who were willing brought burnt offerings. The number of the burnt offerings which the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, 200 lambs. All these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. And the consecrated things were 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep. But interestingly enough, verse 34, the priests were too few, so they were unable to skin all the burnt offerings. Therefore, their brothers, the Levites, helped them until the work was completed and until the other priests had consecrated themselves. So we see here that the Levites, while the priesthood came from the Levites, not all the Levites were priests. They were dedicated to temple service in one way or another, but not all of them served in the role of priests. But they were able to help out with the skinning of the offerings because they were Levites. And we see here also that for the Levites, and let me highlight this, for the Levites were more conscientious to consecrate themselves than the priests. There were also many burnt offerings with fat of the peace offerings and with the libations for the burnt offerings. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was established again. Then Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced over what God had prepared for the people because the thing came about suddenly. And then we go to chapter 30 and we see that Hezekiah ends up sending invitations to both kingdoms, not just Judah, but also those who were left over in Israel. Verse 1, now Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. So while the two kingdoms were divided, we actually see Hezekiah working to bring some joint worship between the two kingdoms. Now, by this time, they had already been brought into exile, but there were still some Israelites who were left over. And we'll see a reference to that. Verse 2, for the king and his princes and all the assembly in Jerusalem had decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month. 
Since they could not celebrate it at that time because the priests had not consecrated themselves in sufficient numbers, nor had the people been gathered to Jerusalem. Thus the thing was right in the sight of the king and all the assembly. So they established a decree to circulate a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and that is from the south all the way to the north, that they should come to celebrate the Passover to the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not celebrated it in great numbers as it was prescribed. And verse 6, we see the message go out. The couriers went throughout all Israel and Judah with the letters from the hand of the king and his princes, even according to the command of the king, saying, O sons of Israel, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to those, that he may return to those who escaped and are left from the hand of the kings of Assyria. And that is in reference to the northern kingdom kingdoms exiled by Assyria. You can see that in 2 Kings 17 verses 5 and 6. Um, the book of Chronicles does not go into detail about that. Verse 7, do not be like your fathers and your brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord God of their fathers so that he made them a horror as you see. Verse 8, now do not stiffen your neck like your fathers, but yield to the Lord and enter a sanctuary which he has consecrated forever and serve the Lord your God that his burning anger may turn away from you. Verse 9, for if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your sons will find compassion before those who led them captive and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate and will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. So even after much of the northern kingdom had been exiled, we see here from the words of Hezekiah that there is still opportunity for repentance to turn back towards God. And we see a very mixed response starting in verse 10. So the couriers passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, some men of Asher, Manasseh, Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. The hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. Now many people were gathered at Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of the Unleavened Bread in the second month, a very large assembly. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a seven-day feast that followed the Passover. Verse 14, they arose and removed the altars which were in Jerusalem. They also removed all the incense altars and cast them into the brook Kidron. Then they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the 14th of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed of themselves and consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings to the house of the Lord. They stood at their stations after their, their custom. According to the law of Moses, the man of God, the priests sprinkled the blood which they received from the, hands of the, from the hand of the Levites. And then we see that there were actually many worshipers who were unclean, that were not properly cleansed. And verse 17, for there were many in the assembly who had not consecrated themselves. Therefore, the Levites were over the slaughter of the Passover lambs for everyone who was unclean in order to consecrate them to the Lord. For a multitude of the people, even many from Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover otherwise than prescribed. So obviously this is not a good thing. They did not... Um, prepared themselves in the proper way, but we see Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary. So the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. So we see that there was probably some sort of outbreak, some sort of sickness. Hezekiah interceded uh, for them, and the Lord goes ahead and heals them. And so we see the celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, verse 21. The sons of Israel present, present in Jerusalem celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days with great joy. And the Levites and the priests praise the Lord day after day with loud instruments to the Lord. Then Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all the Levites who showed good insight in the things of the Lord. So they ate for the appointed seven days, sacrificing peace offerings and giving thanks to the Lord God of their fathers. Then the whole assembly decided to celebrate the feast another seven days. So they celebrated the seven days with joy. For Hezekiah, king of Judah, had contributed to the assembly 1,000 bulls, 7,000 sheep, 
The princes had contributed 1,000 bulls, 10,000 sheep, and a large number of priests consecrated themselves. All the assembly of Judah rejoice, and the priests and the Levites and all the assembly that came from Israel, both the sojourners who came from the land of Israel and those living in Judah. So there was great joy in Jerusalem because there was nothing like this in Jerusalem since the days of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Amazing. In verse 27, then the Levitical priests arose, blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came to his holy dwelling place to heaven. And when we see in verse 27 that their voice was heard, their prayer came to the holy place in heaven, that reminds us in 1 Kings 8 when Solomon finished the temple and then offered up his consecration, his prayer of consecration, of dedication to the temple. And he prayed that the Lord in heaven would hear the prayers of his people when they lifted them up to them. But verse 26, <clears throat> the verse previous, is also very significant. We see that there was nothing like this in Jerusalem since the days of Solomon. You remember that from the time the kingdom was split, Jeroboam created two golden calves and the people of Israel would just worship those two golden calves rather than going into Judah. So this was the first time that the people of the northern kingdom, or at this point what was left of them, were actually coming together to worship in the temple with the people of Judah. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, we see that the altar to false gods were destroyed. Now when all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah, broke the pillars in pieces, cut down the Asherim, and pulled down the high places and the altars throughout all Judah and Benjamin, as well as in Ephraim and Manasseh, until they had destroyed them all. So this was not just in Judah, but this was also in various parts of Israel as well. Then all the sons of Israel returned to their cities, each to his possession. And Hezekiah appointed the divisions of the priests and of the Levites by their divisions, each according to his service, both the priests and the Levites for burnt offerings, for peace offerings, to minister, to give thanks and praise in the gates of the camp of the Lord. He also appointed, appointed the king's portion of his goods for the burnt offerings, namely for the morning and evening burnt offerings, and the burnt offerings for the Sabbath and for the new moons and for the fixed festivals. And I had that underlined because I was reminded that in uh, Isaiah chapter 1 uh, we see that the Lord did not offer did not um, did not re have regard for the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths for the new moons and the various festivals because their heart was not right but in this case they are coming back to the Lord with the right kind of heart and so these kinds of offerings um, are what should be um, established to reflect what is true for the inside of the inside of the worshiper inside the heart of the worshiper and we see these things, it is written according to the law of the Lord. And verse 4, and he commanded, he commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and the Levites that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. This was also part of the Mosaic law that the Levites should be supported by the people. And verse 5, as soon as the order spread, the sons of Israel provided in abundance the first fruit of grain, new wine, oil, honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of all. The sons of Israel and Judah who lived in the cities of Judah also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep and the tithe of sacred gifts which were consecrated to the Lord their God and placed them in heaps. And so we see these heaps, which is the collection of all these offerings. In verse 7, we see in the third month they began to make the heaps and finish them by the seventh month. When Hezekiah and the rulers came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. So they're giving praise for all the offerings, all the givings. And then look at this, Hezekiah in verse 9 questioned the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, said to him, Since the contributions began to be brought into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat with plenty left over, so for the Lord has blessed his people. And this great quantity is left over. So the contributions that the people had brought for the priests had even exceeded what they needed. So they had more left over. And so they're being stored. And in verse 11, we see that the Levite officers and the positions are assigned. Then Hezekiah commanded them to prepare rooms in the house of the Lord. And they prepared them. They faithfully brought in the contributions and the tithes of the consecrated things. And Conaniah the Levite was the officer in charge of them, and his brother Shimei was second. 
and then we go on to see a number of other names so these are all the positions within the Levites being established and as we get to the end of this section we see that uh, verse 19 also for the sons of Aaron the priests who were in the pasture lands of their cities or in each of uh, and every city there were men who were designated by name to distribute portions to every male among the priests and to everyone geneal genealogically enrolled among the Levites so this is to say that all the offerings given to the Levites they had people assigned over them to distribute them to make sure that all the Levites their needs were met and then we see a summary of Hezekiah's work as related to the temple verse 20 thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah and he did what was good, right, and true before the Lord his God. Every work which he began in the service of the house of God, in law and in commandment, seeking his God, he did with all his heart and prospered. And that brings us now to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 8. And in 1 Corinthians 8, we start off with this statement about how knowledge puffs up. And this is a very well-known verse. A lot of people will reference this verse. But it's in my opinion that a lot of people reference this verse incorrectly. A lot of people talk about how knowledge puffs up, but they speak about it as if this is a reason not to pursue knowledge. But that is not the point at all. This is knowledge that is being applied without love. Nowhere in, the, in this, these verses, in this book, is knowledge being condemned. In fact, as you will see, Paul is going to say their problem wasn't knowledge. It was knowledge without love, and that required more knowledge on their part. So verse 1, now concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. And there is the statement right there. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. So there, right there in verse 2, we see that though knowledge makes arrogant, the issue here is that he does not know as he ought to know. Verse 3, but if anyone loves God, he is known by him. And so the issue is about food sacrificed to idols, verse 4. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. Now, verse 4, what is that saying? That idols are not true gods. True gods, other than the one true God, don't exist. And so we know that there is only one God. In verse 5, he goes on to say, For even if, and this is hypothetically speaking, even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things, and we exist for him. So from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom all things by whom are all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, and some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God, and we are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. So this here in verse 7 is referring to people that may not have the knowledge of the freedom that they have to eat whatever they want to eat, but rather they are still in their conscience being bothered by food that is offered up to idols, even though those idols are nothing, they are empty. But Paul goes on to say that for these brothers, don't let your increased knowledge be a reason to put a stumbling block before them. Verse 9, but take care of this liberty of yours, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. And Paul here is illustrating a point. We are not condemned from eating meat. But if that meat causes a brother to stumble, Paul makes the statement here that I will never eat meat again. Now, I don't think that this is, verse shows us that Paul is a vegetarian. He's just making the point about Christian liberty and uh, that he would not eat something that would cause his brother to stumble. Well, that brings us to the end of our reading for this morning. 
Hopefully that has been helpful. The story of Hezekiah should be uplifting and encouraging that after all that rebellion, we see that the grace of God blesses the nation when they simply turn back from all the sins of their fathers. Unfortunately, that's not going to be forever because they will go back into rebellion eventually. Um, and we will read about that as we continue forth in the Old Testament. Let me go ahead and close us out in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and these words. Thank you for your blessings upon us. Thank you for the church. And I pray that you would continue to guide and protect the church of your son, Jesus Christ. May that church glorify Jesus Christ as well as you. And we give thanks and pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us this morning. As always, I encourage you to meditate upon what we have read, to consider what we have read, and to use that. Uh, memorize something if there's a verse there that you found helpful, um, and, and consider the ways in which when we look at Hezekiah and his devotion to the Lord, and even the example of Paul, consider the ways in which we can even improve in our devotion to the Lord as well. Well, thank you once again for joining us this morning. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. It's a Labor Day. Um, enjoy your time off with the family, and uh, God bless.